very excited because we're going to start a three-week series. And I say three weeks, it may actually be four weeks. We're, we'll see how time permits us. Uh, but we're going to do, go, do a, a three to four week session on the 15 invaluable laws of growth. Now, I see you all in the comments. See Sister Evangelist Tamla Harden, Sister Kathy. Uh, say praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Sister Prestina in the house. We see Evangelist Woodard. We see the Wheaton. Say praise the Lord from the Wheaton family. And so we're we're following in. We're not going to hold you up uh, long. See the weights. We're not going to hold you too long. I want to jump right in because we have a lot of uh, information to cover in such a short time. And so if you have something to write with, I would say uh, get those things to write with so that you can take notes. If you don't have something to write with, I'd say uh, click on to the link if you have another device uh, to follow on in the PowerPoint or download the PowerPoint at a later time so that you'll get uh, some, be able to get some information and some understanding. And so as we go on, I don't want to inundate us necessarily throughout these four weeks or three to four weeks with PowerPoint to where we're solely resting on that. But the purpose of this uh, this series uh, that our pastor and our leadership wants to do, we want to be very cognizant about growth. And when we say growth, not just growth, obviously, within the church, you know, making sure we fill up the church and all of those things, but it's personal growth. What I found within churches and in ministries and in organizations you cannot focus on growth of the organization without focusing on the growth of the individuals within the organization. And so what that means is the organization can can, can never grow to, to a capacity higher than those within the organization. And all that means is, uh, you know, if, if we don't grow as individuals within the organization, then the organization becomes stagnant. It becomes uh, a place where it's not growing. It comes to a place where uh, it's not healthy. And so we'll talk about over the next three to four weeks about growth as it relates to us as individuals and then as it relates to us uh, corporately as well. And so I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, 15 uh, invaluable laws of growth. Does, does everybody see that? I want to make sure everybody sees that. Is everybody seeing that? You see it on your screen? Nod your head if you do. Yes. Okay, yes. good, 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 good. So you all bear with us in this virtual environment. Sometimes I just want to make sure because what I'm seeing could be one thing. I want to make sure that you're seeing what I'm seeing. So we're talking about the invaluable laws of leadership, 15 of them. And so as we talk about these invaluable laws, uh, it's referenced from John C. Maxwell. And we see that John C. Maxwell is a New York Times bestselling author, coach, and speaker. He has sold more, more than 24 million books in 50 different languages. He is often called the country's number one leading authority. Maxwell was identified by the by being the most popular leadership expert in the world by Inc. Magazine. That's a magazine that pretty much, uh, you know, judges uh, everything leadership, everything business. And, and he's heralded as being the number one authority in that respect. And so when we look at it, uh, this material is very important because often, you know, I, I don't tell a lot of people this, but John Maxwell is one of my mentors. And I'm, I'm one of uh, the few certified John Maxwell leadership trainers, coaches, and speakers. And so not only is John Maxwell a leading authority in, in this respect as it relates to leadership, uh, but I, I, by nature or by virtue of our relationship being certified through him, I, I'm one of the leading experts as it relates to growth and leadership as well. And so I don't say that to brag. I say that just so that you'll know the credibility of what we'll talk about over the next three to four weeks is not something that is, in theory, nothing that hadn't been tested. It's something that has been tested in what we consider Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies, as well as uh, mega churches, as well as uh, all the way down to storefront churches. So this is stuff that has worked, can work for you. And over the next three to four weeks, if you pay attention to it, if you if you internalize the information, you can grow as well. And so if you're ready to do that, somebody type in the comments. I'm ready to grow. I am ready to grow. 
Can we do that before we start? I am ready to grow. I see Sister Renata says yes. Sister Kathy says yes. Uh, 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 Sister Evangelist Woodard says yes. Uh, Sister Kathy says she's ready to grow. Kelly Lanier says I'm ready to grow. Michelle, ready to grow. All right. So y'all said it. I didn't say it. Y'all said it. You ready to grow. And so let's go. 15 invaluable laws to growth. We're going to go over these. Number one, uh, what we're going to do, and I'm laying a little bit of groundwork before we go so that over the next few weeks, you'll know and have an idea of what we're going to do. And so what we're going to do over the first uh, week, we're going to try to tackle the first five laws. Second week, we're going to do the next five laws. And then the last week, we'll do the last five laws. And I say three to four weeks, because if it goes a little longer, hey, you can't shoot us. We can go a little longer. We got all the time in the world until Jesus comes. And so we'll take our times because I'm, I'm more interested in you grasping the concepts than I am us rushing through it. And so we'll take our time if we have to. And so the first law, the first five laws uh, are the law of intentionality, the law of awareness, the law of the mirror, the law of consistency, and then the law of environment. That's the first five that we'll do. Then we'll go the second week will be the law of design, the law of pain. Uh, the law of design is on there twice. Uh, then we'll have the law of the ladder, the law of the rubber band, the law of the trade-offs, the law of curiosity, the law, law of modeling, the law of expansion, and then the law of contribution, which will be the, the, the other ones that we'll cover when we cover those 15 laws. And so for those of you that downloaded, you'll have this information. It says, uh, live these laws and reach your potential is, is, is our main aim through these particular laws. All right. So somebody might ask, why grow? Why do I have to grow in the first place? What's the whole purpose? Why should I care about this? And when you see the definition there, growing is a stage or condition of increasing, developing, and maturing. Increasing, developing, and maturing. That's our goal. Sometimes, you know, often we can over-spiritualize things in church, and all we want to do is speak in tongues and run around the church. And those things are inspiring to us uh, from from an emotional perspective, sometimes that's a good relief for what we're get, d going with. Sometimes it's a good distraction from what we're dealing with in life. But often it will not necessarily increase you, develop you or mature you. Uh, we, we are often mature. That's why I love Sunday school and Bible class and those things, because we, we are matured through the word of God. We're matured through things that we are internalizing from a mental standpoint, able to grasp those concepts and use them and make them life applicable to our lives. That's how we grow. And so the inspiration that we sometimes get on Sunday morning and, and the, the word, awesome word and the running around and the shouting and the praising the Lord, those things are great. They, 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 they encourage us, but they don't necessarily inspire us. I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I could be wrong. I don't think that we are necessarily matured in God by the shouting and the dancing alone. You got to have something that, that that you take into your spirit, take into your mind, something that you have to learn in order to be able to be increased, developed and matured. So why do we grow? Because God created us to be fruitful and multiply. Often we look at that from a natural perspective of procreation. And trust me, surely God meant that in the aspect of being fruitful and multiplying from a procreation standpoint, meaning having kids and a multiplicity of kids so that those kids could populate the earth, be fruitful and multiply. Yes, that's a great, uh, a great context there. But the other context is being fruitful in spirit, being fruitful in what you produce spiritually. And so being being able to be fruitful and multiply means that I have to be able to be fruitful spiritually. And then what I get spiritually, I begin to multiply that throughout the earth. I begin to develop other disciples. I begin to develop other people that become a part of the kingdom. God didn't just save us for us to be saved alone, but he saved us so that we can allow and be able to see others being saved as well. And so 
he wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Then God created us to develop and to mature us. He wants us to be developed. He doesn't want us to be uh, kids in the gospel anymore. He doesn't want us to just be immature saints, babes in Christ forever. He wants us to be developed into a place to where we are mature. And then he created us to leave a legacy. And this is what legacy means. Often we think legacy just means money, but I believe that legacy means duplicating yourself, duplicating yourself, uh, even if you don't have the capacity to have kids. Not everybody can have children, uh, but we can all duplicate ourselves and have a legacy. And so there are many spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers that have developed and given uh, birth to various gifts and ministries and abilities in the kingdom of God. And so you might say, I don't necessarily have a whole bunch of kids, or I might not even can have kids, or I might not have gotten married, and I I, I, I don't want to have kids outside of marriage. And, and how can I have a legacy? Your legacy can be a spiritual one. You can have a spiritual legacy where you have grown and developed in such a manner that you're able to pass down certain principles and certain things to people uh, that, that are a part of your influence. And so I want us to begin to look at growth in that respect to re where I'm growing from the, the perspective that I want to begin to pass down this stuff for years. Type in the comments, say, stop being so selfish. Stop being so selfish. Some of us are so selfish that we we love sitting at the master's table and getting all this good preaching and teaching, and we want to get it for ourselves. And, and, and but but none of us are giving it to nobody. Stop being so selfish. God didn't give you all this good teaching and preaching and good word for you to keep it among yourself. You got to spread it out. You got to daily have a, a, a diet to get the word and then daily have a habit of dispensing the word. In some way, shape or form, I want to get what God has given to me out. i never forget one of my great mentors, Dr. Johnny James said he wanted to die empty. And we celebrated him on last last week. We celebrated his home going and we celebrated, uh, you know, the, the life and the legacy that he left. And so many people just had the testimony that they had gained so much wisdom and knowledge and understanding from him. And he truly died empty before he died. I say five to 10 years before his his death. He told me, he said, I want to die empty. He started sending me, shipping me books. He started talking to me, mentoring. He started telling me uh, things that I should do in ministry. He started sharing resources with me. This is where I've gotten my books. This is where I've gotten my resources. This is how I formulate my text. This is how I formulate my classes. And so he wanted to die empty. And that's how we all have to be. That's why pastor, our, our, our assistant pastor, that's why myself in this ministry, we've always been prone to, to just building other people up. You know, we may not be the greatest preachers and teachers. We may not be uh, the most anointed on the planet, but one thing you'll never say that we were is selfish, selfish with our resources, selfish with our opportunities, selfish with the things that God gives us, our, our understanding, because our passion, our desire is to add value to you. And so that's what God wants us to do is grow. And so often when we talk about self-help and self-growth and all those things in the church, sometimes people frown on it because they feel like, you know, that ain't churchy enough. You know, you giving me all these concepts and you didn't give me a scripture to go along with it. Listen, sometimes we have to step back and look at principles without being so churchy. Amen, lights. Amen, computer screen. Sometimes we have to do this without being so churchy. Sometimes we can be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Listen, I'm, I'm, I like you. I, I can't wait to uh, to walk on the streets of gold. I can't wait to go through the pearly gates. I can't wait uh, to, to see the four and 20 elders with their crowns and majesty in heaven. I can't wait for all that stuff. But guess what? I ain't in heaven yet. And so I got to learn how to adapt here on earth. I have to adapt to, 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 to learning how to live here on earth. And so that's why we grow. This is interesting. What I found that the apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13, 13 to 14, for those of you that just have to have scripture tonight, I'm going to give it to you. Those of you that that, that know me know I'm not anti-scripture. I love the word of God and I'll, you know, I can go, go down the theology rabbit hole with you all day long. And so I'm not anti-scripture, 
But here's for, for, for those that need scripture tonight. Philippians 3, verse 13 to 14, he says, Brother, and I count not myself to ab have apprehended. Stop. Full stop right there. I count not myself to have apprehended. This is the Apostle Paul. He is the Pharisee of all Pharisees. He is the Jew of all Jews. He is one of the most knowledgeable, most gifted theologians the world has ever known. But he says, I count not myself to have apprehended. I, ha I haven't obtained it all. I haven't learned it all. I haven't gotten it all together, is what Paul is saying, paraphrasing. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, but reaching forth to those things which are before. Forgetting those things that I've already learned but reaching forth to the things that I intend to learn, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our, our Lord. Not that I'm forgetting the foundation that was laid, not that I'm going to forget in the sense of never consider again, but I'm not necessarily worried about what I've already learned. I'm more interested on about what God is wanting to reveal and to teach me now. And so that's where God wants us to get to the place where we can get to the place where we're no longer so stuck in the past. We're no longer nostalgic. I, I just want two or three people to type in the comments. I, I, it's time for me to move forward. It's time for me to move forward. It's time for me to move forward. I can no longer be so worried about my past. I no longer stuck it back, back in convention 2002. I got to get. I got to see what God is saying right now. And so he said, forgetting those things which are behind me, reach forth to those things which are before. This is what I love in Hebrews right here. Hebrews chapter six, one through three, it says, therefore, leaving the principles of our doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of the faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What, what, is, what is the apostle Paul saying there to the Hebrew church? He's saying, not that we're leaving the foundation of docs as, as if we're, we, we're no longer doing them. He's saying, but there's no need for me to keep talking to you about this stuff that you already know. There's no need in me keep harping on the fact of our foundation. That's our fundamental. We know that. But it's time for us now to go on to perfection. Go on to being complete. Listen, you got the doctrine down now. You've been baptized in Jesus' name. You feel the Holy Ghost. You got that? Yes, that's good. Now, let's add upon that foundation so that you can go out and then teach somebody else the foundation and then add upon them. Then they can go out, teach somebody the foundation and then add upon them so that we're not just so stuck in a one minded, one capacity standpoint. God wants to add unto us. And so I see some people say, I'm definitely ready to move forward. Since Sister Renata says, it's time to move forward, Evangelist Woodard. Listen, if I got Evangelist Woodard on my side, it, I, I can do anything. So we're going to move forward. So how can I go? How far can I go is the question. Often we get so stuck in, 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 in a rut that we don't even think outside the box and thinking about how far we can go. And so ask yourself that question right now. What if I thought without limits? What if I thought of myself without any limits? What if Aaliyah says, wakes up one morning and says, listen, I ain't got not one limit on me. Whatever I think, I can make it happen. Whatever I say, I can make it happen. Whatever I believe, I can make it happen. I dare you to believe that right now. Think about that. Take about 15 seconds right now. And if you if you have your notebook, write that question down and ask yourself, how far can I go? How far can I go if I thought without any limits? Without any limits. We look at that scripture there in Ephesians chapter 3 and 20. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power, this is the part that I like, it's already working in you. It ain't, it ain't like nothing you got to go and acquire. It ain't like nothing that you got to hope and pray that happens to you. He's saying he's able to do exceeding abundantly, not exceedingly abundantly, 
He says, I'm willing to do exceeding abundantly, meaning in, in, in the Greek, without getting too deep, I don't want to get stuck in the weeds. But in the Greek there, that exceeding abundant means he's starting at the highest possible maximum apex of a mountain that you can start at. He's saying, I'm starting at the highest point and I'm able to do exceeding abundantly above that. So think of the highest maximum point that you can be, your maximum self, your maximum ability. God say, I'm not starting you from the bottom. I'm starting you at your maximum ability. I'm able to go exceeding abundantly above all of the things that you could possibly ask or think according to the power that's already working in you, meaning everything you need is already there. And then all you got to do is ask it and think it. And I'm able to do exceeding abundant above all of that. And so that's what God is saying in that. How far could you literally go if you really thought and if you really ask without any limits, somebody ought to begin to think about that. I want you to internalize that tonight because I believe that there's a miracle in your mouth. There's power and authority in you that has been untapped. And the only person that you can blame is yourself. See, often we blame a lot of things. We blame our pedigree. You know, if my if, if my parents had a, gave me more upbringing, if if they had to put me in the best schools, if I had a grew up in the right neighborhood, if, if my auntie and uncle were better at this, if 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 if, if, if the man wasn't holding me down, if, if all we got all of these excuses. But really, the only excuse is you, because God is saying the power to obtain everything that is exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think works in you already. And so the only person that we can blame is ourselves. Uh-oh. So let's go to first law. Y'all ready? Somebody say, let's, I'm ready. Somebody, somebody give me your hands. Somebody type in the comments, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go to the first law. We're going to get through these laws and we're going to see what God says. So the first law is the law of intentionality. That means growth doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional. Growth doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional. And so with the law of intentionality, I always say it. I'll say it now until the day that I die. You might get tired of me saying it, but I say that winners don't become winners in reality until they become winners in mentality. Means it has to start in your mind before you get to do it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You literally have the power to will yourself to do things. I think we take for granted the power of your cognitive mind. Your mind has power to begin to frame what you want to see. Winners don't become winners in reality until they become winners in mentality. You have to begin to think this thing. And as you think it, it will become. It has to be intentional growth. This is what I love. James Allen says it. You see the quote there. People are anxious to improve their circumstances, but are unwilling to improve themselves. That's why they remain bound. Uh-oh, I'm stepping on my own toes. We are so anxious sometimes to change our circumstances, but we often don't want to change ourselves. I'll tell you, be honest. As I've grown as a leader, as I've grown as a saint, my willingness to help people change their circumstances is often contingent upon their willingness to change themselves. I'll say that again. Somebody might not like it. You might think that that's uh, anti-biblical. You might, you might judge me. You might even put some shade on me. But in layman's terms, I help people that want to help themselves. I don't go down the rabbit hole, hole of helping people that don't want to do nothing about themselves. I'm much more interested in help, helping you learn how to fish than to giving you a fish. That might you might you might think that that's mean. You might think that that's cruel. You might think that that's cold. But I'm telling you, I've been saved and I've been in leadership long enough to know that if you help people that don't want to help themselves, you'll keep repeating the cycle of helping them without any progress ever being seen. And what I mean by that, I can help you and help you and help you and help you, but until you're ready to make a change for yourself, it's going to be a moot point. I'll look back 
I, you know, Sister Michelle said it right there. That's a dummy mission, right? That's a dummy mission. I'll look back five years from now and you'll be in the same predicament and I will have not helped you not one bit if I do not get you focused on how you can change your own circumstances. And, 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 and when you get that, you become self-sufficient. Listen, we want all the saints of PDT to become self-sufficient. We've had, I think, organizations and why churches don't grow and why they don't become as powerful as they can be and why groups and businesses and organizations stay stuck in a rut is primarily the leader and the follower become stuck in a, in a rut of comfortability. And what I mean by that is the follower becomes so comfortable and reliant on the leader that they don't grow. And then the leader becomes so comfortable and reliant on being the leader that they need that stroke of their ego of the follower to be dependent on them. Uh-oh, somebody not going to like this. So what happens is we neither one of us grow because the leader grows a dependency upon you being dependent on him. And then the follower grows a dependency of being dependent on the leader. And we don't ever grow because the leader needs you to need him. And then the follower needs to need the leader. And that's not the way God wants it to be. God wants to build and grow self-sufficient disciples so that you're not so dependent. You're mature. You're able to grow. You're able to expand. You're able to develop so that you can go out and develop other people. Listen, it, it, it benefits me pastor, our assistant pastor, nothing to have a dependency upon the, the saints and the saints having a dependency on us so that neither one of us are growing. I, I need you to be like a baby so that it strokes my ego. And then you need to be like a baby. So you feel like you're being protected. No, no, no. That's not what God wants. God wants us to grow. The only purpose of the shepherd is to lead you so that you're able to grow and so that you're always able to grow and develop and we're able to expand the kingdom of God so that we will have mature saints that are not falling off at every little slight and are not offended by every little thing that are able to grow and develop and pour into other people. Listen, if it takes 20, 30 years to grow a Christian disciple, that's too long. That's too long. If it takes us 30 years to grow and develop, then the kingdom will never grow. We need us to grow and to develop. And we only grow and develop by, by getting into the word of God, by taking these concepts and having daily devotion. Your daily devotion will determine your destiny. And that's the sole purpose of why we're doing what we're doing through this. So you have to be intentional. But there are gaps that keeps us from growing. There are gaps that keeps us from growing. There's a gap between knowing and doing. You see it there on the screen. This is the greatest gap. The greatest gap in the world is the space between knowing and doing. When you know what to do, you have to do what needs to be done. But there's often a gap in between there. Sister Donna, I think she's Donna trying to write and annotate on here. And so there's a gap between knowing and doing, knowing and doing. And so in knowing what doing, Luke 12 and 47 says, uh, says, this is Jesus talking. It says that the servant and that servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to the will, shall be beaten with many stripes. In other words, he that know to do good and don't do it shall be whipped with many stripes. This is not necessarily literally, but this is saying you're going to pay too much for having the knowledge of what to do and not doing it or not being prepared to do it, you're losing in the, in, in the interim. There's some things that God wants to do for you, but when you know to do it and you don't do it, then there's consequences. You're not going to be able to grow to the capacity when you know to do it, but you decide, hey, I'm not going to do it. And so really quickly, we're going to talk about those gaps that keeps us from doing those things that keep us from knowing, but not eventually converting it to doing it, doing it. And so let's talk about some of those. 
Some of those gaps, number one is the assumption gap. Number two is the knowledge gap. Number three is the timing gap. Number four is the mistake gap. All of us have experienced this. Some of the, some of us more than others, but all of us have had the assumptions gap. We just assume I will just automatically grow. And we've already said the number one law is the law of intentionality. You will not automatically grow. You have to be deliberate in your growth. We'll talk about having a growth plan. So your assumption often, we just assume, you know, I'll I'll just grow. You know, if I, if I hang around the church long enough, I'm going to grow. No, that you guys folk been around church 20, 30 years and ain't learned nothing yet. There's some folk that, that, that say, you know, I, well, I've been saved 25 years and they don't know nothing. And then there are some people that have been saved two, three years, and I'm looking at them and watching them grow leaps and bounds. And so don't just equate longevity with growth, because longevity does not always equal growth in the kingdom. There are some folk right now in our congregation that's been saved half the amount of time that some of us have, and they're more further along than you in maturity. Somebody ain't going to like this. <laughs> I'm not going to call no names. I'm not going to indict you or put you on the spot. But there are some people that have only been saved five years that are more mature than some folk that's been saved 25. And I'm not happy to say that. And so the assumption growth is that I will automatically grow. No, you won't. You have to be intentional. Number two, the knowledge gap. I don't know how to grow. Some of us will say that. Well, I don't know how to grow. Listen, there's no excuse for that in this day and time. We are literally living in the information age. If you don't know, ask. If you don't know, seek. If you don't know, look out for ways that you can learn and grow. There's, listen, there's ways to, to get paid for, uh, you, you know, uh, get paid to go to school. Ask, ask Evangelist Wade. Evangelist Wade, uh, can you testify? Uh, are, are there not ways that people actually pay you? Uh, do you not get paid to learn? Yes, sir. You've had this way. Can you testify for us? Give us an exhibit. A now, are, 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 are your, your degrees that you got. Did you have to go and pay for them yourself? Or did they did they pay for them for you? No, sir. They paid for them for me and they gave me bonus checks for, you know, getting them. So not only they did gave, they pay for them. Not only did they pay me for them, they also paid me just because I was decided to go get them. And they paid me gas money to get there to go get them. See, look at that. <laughs> Folk are paying you to learn. P people are paying you to grow. Even this class that we're taking right now, whether you know it or not, you might not even know it. But this class right now for John Maxwell, uh, this type of training and leadership, most people pay to get this. But you're getting it as a fringe benefit as being a part of this ministry. Listen, I can go right now and, and go to a Fortune 500 company and they will pay me anywhere between ten to $15,000 to go and do this class that you're getting for free. And so you have no excuse not to grow. Not to grow. You have no excuse. Somebody type in the comment. I have no excuse not to grow. You're getting information and knowledge. You're getting a million dollars worth of game for free. And so you have no problem. You have no reason to have the knowledge gap. The next one is the timing gap. It's not the right time to grow. Well, if it's not the right time, when will be the right time? If now is not the right time, when will be the right time for you to grow? So you'd rather delay and waste time and not grow and not develop, not not add into your life. You'd rather just sit there and just be dormant and stagnant and not grow. That's not that don't make any sense. You got to invest in yourself. Listen, sometimes we are so willing to invest in others so much that we leave ourselves dormant. You got to give to yourself until you're full. And then give out of your overflow. That's why some of us are so burnt out. We feel so neglected. We feel so drained. We feel like, you know, I can't go in because you're not giving and you're not adding to yourself. You're not growing. Listen, the only reason why I'm able to pour out the way I do to the, to the church, the only reason why our pastor and our assistant pastor are able to pour out the way they do is because we vehemently daily on a, a, a habitual basis try to pour into ourselves try to learn, try to grow, try to do as much as we can so that we have something to give. You won't have nothing to give if you don't add to yourself. And so the time is now. There's an urgency. 
There's an immediacy. Listen, there's an urgency and an immediacy that I talk to people with now because I have no time to waste. My most valuable commodity, your most valuable commodity, our it's most time. valuable commodity is time. You, your time is so significant. You don't, you don't know when, when your life is but a vapor, the, the scriptures say. And so you have no time to waste. You have to be urgent. When God places some things on your heart, do it. Do it now. Don't wait. It, the time is now. Don't wait. And so the next one is the one that all of us mostly have. It says it's the mistake gap. I'm afraid of making mistakes. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake. Stop being afraid of making mistakes. The only way you're going to learn and grow is to make mistakes. Most of us are afraid of failure. And more importantly, we're afraid of what I call the fame of failure. What do you mean, Elder Green? We're afraid of the fame of failure. The fame of failure is people knowing that I failed. See, if, if, if we if we could if we could fail behind the scenes and nobody knew our failures, we'd be fine. But it's it's the fear of the fame of failure, people knowing that you failed. And all of that is pride. All of that is pride. The fact that you don't want nobody to know that you don't know it all. The fact that you don't want nobody to know that you ain't got it all together. The fact that you don't want nobody to know that you're not infallible. That is that is straight out pride. Get over your pride and grow. Get over your pride and grow. Tell somebody I might not have it now, but I'll have it soon enough. I might not got it all together now, but I'm going to learn it. I'm going to get it all together. I might be making mistakes now, but guess what? You're going to be coming to me as an expert when I figure it out. Why? Because through trial and error and mistakes and having those failures, I learn how to do it the right way. And when I learn how to do it the right way, then I'm going to monetize it. <laughs> and then I'm going to charge you uh, for laughing at me. I'm going to charge you because I'm going to learn how to do it. Ain't that right, Brother B? You can laugh at me now, but wait, wait, wait till I get my, my No Excuses Fitness. You're going to be coming to me to get shedding those pounds then because I'm an expert and I've I've grown myself and I've gotten the certifications. And then you can't say nothing then. I, 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 hey, once I'm certified, once I'm prepared, hey, who you going to laugh at then? And somebody ought to get that in your spirit right now. Let them laugh now. They'll pay me later. Let them laugh now. But they'll pay me later because God is perfecting you and he's giving you the ability to do what you need to do. And so those are the four five, four gaps, but we have some other gaps. This is one that some of us have. It's the perfection gap. I have to find the best way to do it before I start. Listen, this is where I take it upon my shoulders to say, uh, uh, speak Lord to me. Because there was a lot of times that I, I wouldn't put out stuff that God had given me because I wanted it to be perfect. And this perfection gap keeps you from moving forward and growing because you, you end up not doing anything because you're prolonging everything because it's not perfect. And so in essence, you're saying, you know, I, when it gets perfect, I'll do it. And you end up not doing anything. And God is saying, I am against that. I want you to be not. Now, I'm not saying don't be excellent. I'm not saying don't go on to be uh, perfection. But what I am saying is sometimes we use that perfection gap as an excuse. We use that as, as an excuse of not going forward and doing what God wants us to do. Stop it. Do what God told you to do. Oh. Grow it. Make it excellent. And it will it will be it will become perfected over time. You know, my, one of my mentors, Les Brown, says practice does not make perfect. <laughs> practice makes better. And so as you go forward, you'll learn how to practice, but it won't make you perfect. It just make you better. And you'll learn how to grow. All right. Number six, the inspiration gap. Gap. I don't feel like growing. Listen, you better get over yourself. Somebody type in the comments. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Inspiration gap. I don't feel like growing. You're not always going to feel like growing, but it's a necessity. You have to grow because if you're not growing, you are regressing in i.e. I you're dying. And that's what's happened to some of us spiritually. That's what's happening to some of us emotionally and mentally. We're regressing because we refuse to allow ourselves to be inspired because we're so feelings driven. Get over your feelings. You got to press beyond what you feel like and do it until it feels good again. Do what you've been called to do until it feels good again. It's a cycle. You're going to go through cycles where you feel like it. 
You're going to go through cycles when you want to. You're going to go through cycles where you question whether or not this is what you've been called to do. Go through that cycle. Go through it. It's normal. It's natural. But just don't stop. Keep doing it until it feels good again. So get over that inspiration gap. The comparison gap. Comparison kills. Others are better than me. So what? So what? Others are better than you. So what? That, don't, that means nothing. That, don't, that shouldn't keep you from doing what you're doing. Because guess what? Somebody needs what you have to offer. Sometimes we want to be an expert and know everything, but you don't need to know everything. You just need to know a little bit more than somebody else. And if you know a little bit more than somebody else, you can mentor that person. You ain't got to know everything. I just need to know a little bit more than somebody else. And that's it. And as you learn, you grow and you grow and you grow and stop comparing yourself. There's What, what you need to do is, is to acknowledge and appreciate others' gifts, but stop comparing. Listen, there's some things administratively that I can't do as great as Sister Lee. There's some things that 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 I can't do as great as Sister Michelle or or the Wheatons or Brother Wade. You know, I, I don't necessarily have the gift and the charisma to win souls the way Brother Wade does. But I ain't got to compare myself because why? We're part of the same kingdom and we're part of the same body. And so I use Brother Wade's gifts to in, in, enhance the body. And I, I still get get excited and happy. Why? Because I'm a part of the same group. I'm a part of the same body. So stop comparing, acknowledge and appreciate other people's gifts, but stop comparing. You can only be you. I can only be Roger. I, I Listen, I can only be Roger. And even more specifically, I can only be Roger Jr. I can't be Roger Sr. I do a terrible job at being Roger Sr., but I do a pretty all right job at being Roger Jr. So I don't compare myself even to my father. I appreciate and love what he brings to the table. I glean and draw and try to get as much wisdom and understanding from him as possible, but I'll never be Roger Green Sr. Same with you. Stop comparing. The next one, the expectation gap. I thought it would be easier than this because your expectations aren't, aren't up to par. You say, you know, I can't go on because I thought it was going to be easier than this. And so your expectations have let you down. And because it's not easy, you decided I don't want to go for it. Stop it. You got to take on some of the tough stuff. You got to take on some of the tough stuff. And some of the people that are in this room right now are some tough cookies. You've endured some hardship as good soldiers. You have saw people come and go. You've done some things and you've endured it and you've gotten through that gap. And God is re ready to take you to another level of growth. So what is a growth plan? Do you have a growth plan? Somebody ask, ask yourself that question. Do you have a growth plan? Have you really sat down and thought about it? Do you have a plan for how you're going to grow spiritually? How are you going to grow in your business? How are you going to grow in your personal self-walk? Do you Are you intentional about that growth? Do you have a plan? It says here in the growth plan, if you don't fail to plan, you're planning on failing. That's what Benjamin Franklin said. If you don't plan, if you if you fail to plan, then you're planning on failing. You're going to plan to fail if you don't have a plan, because growth should, as much as possible, be intentional and planned. Evaluate anticipated growth over both the short and long term. Listen, I, I look at it every year in October. I try to execute my plan. I think about my plan in September. That's one reason why we're doing this training now as we're going into September because I want you to be growth minded so that in October you can start with the plan so that October, November and December you're working towards your plan so that in January, the new year, you're hitting the ground running. Most people start in January and it's not until March that they have momentum and you've lost a whole quarter of the year. You've lost a whole quarter of the year trying to get right in January. No, starting in October, October, November, December, I'm planning towards the new year so that when I get in January, I'm hitting the ground running and I have more momentum than anybody that's working towards me because I already have a plan. I'm not getting ready. Listen, if you if you if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. That's one of my that's one of my mottos. If you stay ready, you never have to get ready. All right. A growth plan. You must want to grow before growth happens. 
If you are satisfied with your present status, you will not work heartedly towards your growth. If you're complacent, if you're satisfied, if you're saying, well, if it don't broke, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you have that mentality, you'll never grow. You have to say, if it ain't broke, then break it. In other words, it can always be better. I can always be a better version of myself, no matter how much quote unquote success I might think I have. I can be better at what I'm doing. How can I be better? We can't rest on our laurels. PDT, I could care less what God has done for us in 26 years. That's fine and dandy, but that's gone and passed. The question is, what are we going to do in the next 26 years? Not what has God done in the past 26 years. What will we do in the next 26 years? That's what we got to be intentional about. And so these are the three areas we have to look at really quickly. Mindset, heart set. Skill set, mindset, heart set, skill set, mindset, heart set, skill set. I might sound like a cheerleader, like I'm, it's a pep rally tonight. Mindset, skill set, heart set. I want that to be in your thinking. It's mindset, how I think. I have to be uh, intentional about how I think. Skill set, how I operate. I have to be intentional about how I operate. Heart set. How I feel, I have to be intentional about how I feel because all of that will affect my growth. How I think, how I operate, and how I feel because how I feel will influence how I think and how I think will influence how I operate. And the reason why we're not growing and the reason why things are not successful often is because we got the wrong mindset, the wrong heart, and the wrong way we operate in doing things create systems that's how i operate create a system and when you create a system it's like rinsing and repeating you can do it over and over and over because that system will begin to work because i have the right mindset my mind will determine how far i go and i'll operate have the right systems in place and my heart will be right my motives will be right listen there's a difference between a visionary and an opportunist a visionary and opportunist. Opportunist cares about just solely themselves and how they can impact themselves. Visionaries and true leaders care about how they influence and affect others. And so an opportunist, opportunist will always be uh, self only, but the others will be influenced about themselves. I want to gain and, and Im impact and grow myself so that I can impact others. And that's where you want to be. So heart set, skill set, mindset. All right. Ask yourself, are your growths, are your goals realistic? Listen, I, I believe we can do anything in the world, but you also have to have realistic goals. Listen, I'm 44 years old this year. I love basketball. I committed most of my youth and early adolescence and early adulthood to playing basketball, conditioning for basketball playing in little league, high school, even college level, uh, all that being an athlete. But for me to say my goal is to play in the NBA right now, I don't care how much God we got. That's an unrealistic goal. I ain't playing in the NBA. That ain't realistic. And so get some realistic goals. Do you have the capacity to reach that goal? In my head, I say, yeah. But my back and my knees and my ankles say no. And so, no, I don't have the capacity to reach that goal. And so you have to have realistic goals. Are you preparing in stages to reach those goals? If they are realistic, are you preparing in stages? You might say, I want to be a millionaire, but you're not even a thousandaire yet. Are you preparing to become a real a millionaire in stages and goals? You can get there, but you're not going to get there overnight. Are you saving? Are you in, in certain investments that will trend that way? You know, are you do you have a financial planner? Do you have a financial mentor? Do you have things that you've laid out to get you to that end goal? Are you prepared for the results of growth? This is what we're going to talk about now. Everybody want to grow. But what if God made you a millionaire overnight? Are you prepared to handle it? What if, you know, you're preaching a teacher and God just opens up and gives you 
52 dates out of the out of out of the year say okay every week you're going to be gone preaching and teaching the word of god you know everybody feel like you know i want to be utilized I, I want people to call on me to preach i want people to call on me to teach i want people to acknowledge my gift okay what if we all acknowledge your gift and opportunity just fell out the sky are you able to handle that right now and so we talk about growth, but do you have the capacity? Have you even planned around growth? What your life would look like if God shifted you immediately like that and begin to open up doors? Are you able to do it? If you got a business, if, are you able to handle that growth? If if you start getting your phone ringing like off the hook like that, are you able to handle the business? Are you able to handle the capacity of the business from a mental and a, a physical and a psychological standpoint, from an infrastructural standpoint? standpoint infrastructure matters amen sister michelle and so all of this is talking about growth i want you to wrap all of that around your mind to get it to the place that not only am i working on my mindset my heart set and my skill set i'm working on the capacity of when god blesses me to grow will i be able to handle it? can i maintain the highest level of quality with rapid growth that's something that uh, we, we look at even with, with PDT, when the leadership, when we're talking about growth and doing things, that's for one reason why we're not really streaming right now. You know, many may want, wonder and trust me, we're working towards that. One of the biggest things is we're not ready right now to operate at the highest level uh, to, to have that growth that can happen from a virtual perspective. And so instead of throwing up, uh, you know, virtual presentations that we'll all be embarrassed about, we're working on infrastructure and things in the background and systems so that we can operate it and do it correctly so that when we grow, we're growing from a standpoint that we're prepared for that growth, anticipating that growth. And, and that those are the things we're doing. And so the qu big, big questions that you have to ask yourself as you grow is, am I able to function through this? And so we're going to move as we go, because I want you to think about this growth plan. I want you to begin to write in your notes. I need to have a plan for my development. I need to have a plan on how I'm going to grow over the next six months, over the next three years, over the next 10 years, over the next decade. Listen, I think I've planned out right now over the next decade. Now, this is the caveat. God is it can subject to change that at any time. That's fine. Let God change it as he sees fit, but he's not going to come and find me without a plan. He's not going to come and find me unprepared. He's not going to come and find me slopeful because preparation should always come before presentation. Yeah, preparation before presentation. Listen, I'm not ready for the world if I haven't prepared for the world. So why? Because preparation breeds competence meaning the ability to know what I'm doing, how to do what I'm doing, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so preparation comes before presentation because preparation breeds competence, and then competence breeds confidence. So I become confident the more competent I am, meaning when I know what I'm doing, I'm confident. That's why I don't agonize and I don't worry about when I have to preach and teach. Not because I'm cocky and arrogant and think I'm the greatest preacher and teacher in the world. No, because I prepare daily. And so pastor can ask me to preach or teach at any given moment. I got 15, 20 messages I've already been working on. And so it's not arrogance. It's confidence in knowing that I'm competent. And let me let me save someone. Let me let me deliver someone right now. Confidence is not prideful. Stop making people think just because you saved that you got to have this false faux humility like oh no i'm nothing i don't know anything i'm lowered in dirt uh you know god gets all the glory and i'm nothing yes god gets the glory but you can have confidence and know that you're awesome and you're fearfully and wonderfully made and you're highly competent and skilled at what you're doing god wants you to be skilled and competent and he wants you to have confidence and have self-confidence in yourself and so i want to free anybody to think that you got to dumb yourself down just because you say, no, stop dumbing yourself down. If you're good at what you, you do, we want to see it. If you're good at what you want to do, we want to put it to work to advance in the kingdom. Stop acting like you ain't good at what you do. No, you're good at what you do. There are certain things that God has gifted me with that I know is a particular skill set that everybody cannot do. 
and I thank God for it. I glorify him for it. I'm confident in that. I'm not cocky in it. I'm not arrogant in it, not prideful in it, but I am fully aware that this is something that not everybody can do. Somebody ought to type in the comments. There are some things that I am gifted to do that not everybody can do. Somebody believe that. You got to say that about yourself. You got to believe that about yourself. You got to know that about yourself. There are some things that God has gifted you to do. If nobody's ever told you that, Sister Leek, there's some things that God has gifted you to do that nobody else is gifted to do. Sister Teresa, there are some things that God has gifted you to do that nobody is gifted to do. S Sister Ryan, there, there's certain things that God has gifted you to do that nobody else is gifted to do. Sister Mary, there's some things that God has gifted you to do. Sister Tamla, Sister Kim, I can go down the line. There are all of you that are on here. There are some things that God has gifted you to do that nobody can do. All right? And so I want you to know that. All right, let's go on to law number two. We're going to go through this really quickly. I know normally we're done at eight. We're going to go a little over tonight and, and for the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you got to jump off, jump off. But we're going to we're going to cover some of this. Number two, law of awareness. You must know yourself to grow yourself. You got to know yourself and grow yourself. If you're going to lie to anybody, do me a favor. Do not lie to yourself. Do not lie to yourself about yourself. If you got to lie to somebody, don't lie to yourself about yourself. You got to know yourself in order to grow yourself. And so Proverbs 23 and 7 says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You, 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 you know, as you think about yourself, that's what you're going to become. So who are you? According to you, who are you? Who are you? You know, who are you in the grand scheme of things? To grow yourself, you got to know yourself. You got to know your strengths. You got to know your interest. You got to know your weaknesses. You got to know the opportunities God has given you. You got to know uh, where you are, where you want to be. Those are just a few things you got to know about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And guess, guess what? This is what I've learned about life. Even my weaknesses are a strength. In knowing your weakness, that's a strength. God can bless you in knowing your weaknesses. In knowing your weaknesses, that's a strength. Why? Because I don't spend a long, a long time on stuff I know I'm not good at doing. I get help. Listen, if you're not honest with yourself, there's some people that can't sing that think they can sing and will spend a whole long time trying to audition for uh, American Idol and they waste a whole lot of time in their life no, thinking that they can sing, knowing they, they can't sing because they won't be honest with themselves. That's your weakness. Stop doing it. Don't spend a lot of time with your weakness. Let other people around you that have strengths where you're weak supplement your weakness. And so what I mean by that, if you know you're weak in a certain area, surround yourself around people that are great at that. That will not only increase your level of weakness, but it will give you strength and help and sabbatical from the stuff that you can't do well. Listen, when, when, when I was doing a lot of stuff in, 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 you know, the PAW, North Carolina State Council, or even, even not just in that, in the corporate world, corporate sector, when I've been in, in various leadership capacities, I've always tried to surround myself around people that do what I don't do well better than me. So that this, so that my systems can be strengthened and they won't be limited by what I can't do. And so know your weaknesses and, and find out how to grow in, in those particular areas. There's nothing wrong with having weaknesses. It's just how you handle them. All right. Three kinds of people trying to find direction. See where you fit in these three. People who don't know what they would like to do. They are the confused. The people that don't, that don't know what they would like to do. I, well, you know, what are your purpose? What would you like to do? I, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. You know, they're vacillating. They're, they're confused. You don't want to be one of those. Then there are people who know what they want but don't do it. They are the frustrated. You're going to always be frustrated when you know what you want, but you're not achieving it. When you know you're not living up to your full potential. Yeah. You're going to constantly be frustrated, but then there are those that, that know what they want and then they do it. Those are the fulfilled. And so you'll never get fulfillment. Trust me. Whenever you're displaced, whenever you're in a place where you're, you're, you're not doing what you know, you've been called to do. You're going, you're going to constantly be frustrated. 
You know, when you know God is doing and, 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 and can I tell you a little secret? Uh, those of you that have been to church for a while, you might can attest to this. If God gifts you with something and you got the wrong spirit, the wrong attitude and you ain't doing it, God will always put somebody in the church doing what you do well and they'll do it and they'll do it poorly. And it will vex your spirit because you'll see them doing it terribly. And God will say, hey, don't you complain at all. Because you could be doing it, but because you're slowful and you ain't doing it, I'm going to let them keep doing it in your face to vex you. And so I don't know who I'm talking to, somebody that's gifted to do some stuff and you're vexed by people that ain't doing it as well as you. It's because they're doing it and you're not doing it. Get to doing what God has called you to do. That's a part of growth. Get over yourself and just do it. Get over yourself so that you can relieve them from doing it poorly and they can go do what they're called to do and do what they do better. And so be one of those people that's fulfilled. Here it says, if you know you, uh, what would you do? Uh, if you knew you could not fail, what would you do right now? Let's, some of you unmute. What, what would you do right now if you knew you could not fail, Brother Blackman? If you knew that your business could not fail, what would you do? The question is, what wouldn't I do? <laughs> you are all in. Uh, yes, sir. From top to bottom, if I knew it couldn't fail, everything that uh, would cross my mind to do it would be done. So, 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 what would you do if I freed you tonight and tell you you can't fail? On and popping, <laughs> all systems go. <laughs> well, I'm telling you that right now. I'm telling everybody on here you cannot fail. There's no such thing as losses. There's a thing as lessons. I don't lose. I just learn. And so even in, in, in what is perceived to be a loss, it's just a learning experience. I can't fail. God has set you up to not fail. You will not fail. Success is in your DNA spiritually, that as long as your steps are ordered by the Lord, God, God will not allow you to fail. Uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. He, he, he talks about it, you should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that in his season, uh, you're going to bring forth fruit. God, God wants to bring forth fruit in you. You, you can literally accomplish whatever you want to accomplish, but you got to be aware of yourself. So you got to find your passion and your purpose. Do you like what you're doing? Somebody need to stop right there. Let's pause right there. Let's evaluate our life right now. Do you like what you're doing currently? Do you like what you're doing? Do you like the job, Joan? Do you like the trajectory that your life is going? Do you like where you are? If the answer is no, the question is, why aren't you changing it? If you don't like it, why are you still doing it? Why are you still doing it? If you don't like it, why are you still doing it? The question is, why are you allowing yourself to live an unfulfilled life? There's no reason for it. There's no reason for it because success is imminent. And so this is what I want you to do. How to do what you want to do. Number one, awareness. You got to be aware of what you want to do, number one. Number two, you got to have accountability. You got to hold yourself accountable and say, look, in order to get there, this is what I'm going to have to sacrifice. This is what I'm going to have to do. This is who I'm going to have to surround myself around. I got to have awareness, accountability. Then number, two, number three, I got to take action. I got to take action and then... The last one, I got to have some type of attraction. I have to be uh, I have to draw uh, those things to me. I have to begin to speak those things that be not as though they were. I have to be begin to manifest those things through God. And so that's how you're going to take action. And, and uh, you got to be committed. You got to be co consistent. You got to be creative, reflective, purposeful, grateful. These are all ways for you to accomplish what you need to accomplish in God. All of that's going to happen uh, through, through that sacrifice, through that being committed, being creative. Don't let your dream die. This is one thing that I want to share with you before, before we move on. Don't let your dream die. Write the vision. Keep that written vision visible and accessible. What, what I've done before, you know, some people put sticky notes. Some people, uh, you know, might print it out. And, and tack it to your refrigerator. Uh, some people might 
uh, do various things since I'm always on my phone. Sometimes I, I'll, I'll type it out and I'll put it as a screensaver on my phone. And so that every time I unlock my phone and open my phone, that message is there just to remind me to keep it visible and accessible. Then develop your dreams and the plans because thoughts without a plan is nothing more than a dream. Your dreams, you know, no, no, you know, I, I don't mean to sound callous, but nobody cares about your dream. What about your plan? I don't care about your dream. You can dream all day. People dream all day. You got people sit on the corner and, and, and winos sit on the corner and they dream all day, but they don't put them to plan. What are your plans? Thoughts put to paper as a plan. Reason why I don't care nothing about your dream, because there's no accountability attached to a dream. There's no accountability. You can dream. Or I can wake up from, like, from my sleep at night and have had a dream and there's no accountability to it. There's accountability to a plan. You're only accountable to your dream when your dream becomes a plan. And so stop just dreaming, plan, make a plan. All right, then find you a coach or a mentor. Find you a coach or a mentor. Find you a coach and a mentor. Surround yourself around, a, you know, your pastor, surround yourself around people who have accomplished uh, what, what you need uh, to be accomplished. Uh, you know, surround yourself around, you know, and, and and I'll say this too, often in the church, we we think we we put too much weight and responsibility on our pastor. Not, you know, we, we're honored and blessed to have such a skillful and gift, gifted pastor. But listen, you can't expect your pastor to be your catch all and be all. You can't expect your pastor to be able to answer all your phone calls, to be able to give you financial advice, to be give, give you legal advice, to be your psychiatrist, to be, it's just too much for one person. Notwithstanding that your pastor and your, your assistant pastor and your leaders can't give you guidance, you have to be able to have mentors in various places. Get you a financial planner. You know, some of us need some mental health uh, uh, help. We need to go to a psychiatrist. Amen. I'm still preaching and teaching. Some of us need professional help. And that's okay. That is quite all right. You need professional help. And, and, it, and it, it extends beyond the scope of what the pastor can give you on a Sunday morning sometimes. It's okay to get help. And if you need resources, we, we have resources that we can recommend to you to get the help that you need. But these are the things that we talk about when we talk about that law. Uh, number two, that that, that, that law of, of being able to to be knowledgeable about what you need and, and having it within yourself. And so we have about 10 more minutes. I want to get to at least law three uh, before we clo close and we'll catch up because we did a lot of introductory background tonight that it, we won't have to spend so much time during the subsequent weeks. And so law number three, law of the mirror. Law of the mirror. And so the first law is the law of intentionality, intentionality, being intentional. Everybody got that? That's the first law. Then the, the second law uh, we said was, let me go back to my notes. Uh, law number two was the law of awareness. Law number three is the law of the mirror. You must see value in yourself in order to add value in yourself. You must see value in yourself in order to add value to yourself. Before we get go any further, unmute your phones and say, I am valuable. I am. I am. I am valuable. I am valuable. Amen. I love that. I love hearing your voices. I am valuable. You have to believe that in order to see value in yourself, uh, is in or, you must add, see value in yourself before you can add value in yourself. And so you got to start thinking more highly of yourself. You sometimes you gotta you gotta have some self care days. You gotta uh, start taking yourself out on dates. <laughs> that might sound that might sound comical, but start taking yourself out. Start appreciating yourself. Stop letting people take advantage of you and, and speak negatively of you and, and, and treat you any old kind of way. 
Think more positive of yourself. In order to add value to yourself, you got to see value in yourself. You have to view yourself. Your view of yourself will de determine your behavior. And what that means is if you think lowly of yourself, you'll start treating yourself low. If you think high of yourself, you start treating yourself high. I, I don't I don't go certain places. I don't eat at certain places. You know, uh, uh, you know, myself, Sister Joy and I uh, went to a restaurant about a couple of weeks ago. And we walked in there and, uh, you know, as soon as we walked in there, you know, the glass on the front door was just smudgy and dirty. And so we we looked at it and said, wow, this door is a little dirty. But we didn't think nothing of it. We kept on walking. We walked to to the uh, registration table or the you know, hostess station and it, it was trash around that. And we looked around and said, wow. So as as the hostess began to seat us, we went to our table. Uh, the table was dirty and and there was paper towels and uh, forks and knives up under our table and begin to look around and it was dirty everywhere we go. And, and so you know, at that point, we said, you told the host to say, well, no, thank you. You know, we're going to go somewhere else. Uh, and, and as we left and we got in the car, we, we talked about it. And we said, you know, it's certain places we just won't eat because we feel like we deserve better. And so you have to have that mentality about yourself and knowing that there's certain things that I just won't sit through because I have to condition myself to understand that I deserve better than this. I deserve better treatment from people. There's certain things that I don't even argue with people about. You know, in the business world, sometimes when people don't want to pay me for certain services, I don't argue with them. I say, that's fine because I know my worth. I just won't do it for that price. <laughs> and so you have to know your value, know your worth. Uh, one will never outperform their self-image. One will never outperform their self-image. You can't act, you can't expect someone to act like a king if they don't view themselves as a king. You can't expect someone to act themselves like a queen if they don't view themselves as a queen. They'll never outperform their self-image. And so I want you to start working on your self-image, start looking at yourself in the mirror. Start telling you yourself, I am awesome. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. God says that I am powerful. God says I am anointed. God says that I am purposeful. God says he knows the thoughts that he has towards me, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give me an expected end. Listen, start speaking those things to yourself. Because the value we put on ourselves is the values others will put on us as well. People will only treat you according to how they see you treat yourself. I'll say that again. People will treat you often according to how they see you treat yourself. If they see you treat yourself like trash, there's no reason for them to treat you like you're not. They'll treat you according to how they see you treating yourself. And so you have to get into that place where you're building this self-worth. You're seeing yourself as valuable. You're seeing yourself in, in a positive way. You're seeing yourself in a way that that that, that you know that I, I'm, I'm not just any old person. I am an amazing person. These are those steps to building your self-esteem. I know we're talked about a lot tonight, and I have to give you all of this because I really want to be thought provoking for you tonight. I want you to go home and can't go to sleep for the next two, three hours thinking about how much you got to grow, thinking about how intentional you have to be, how aware you have to be, how much you got to look in the mirror and have a positive self-esteem. I want you to think of this stuff. So number one, the best way to do it is guard your self-talk. Guard your self-talk. I want you to guard your self-talk. Stop thinking about how poorly you are, your flaws, I don't look good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not gifted enough, I don't have enough money, stop. Guard your self-talk. If, 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 if you don't pay attention to anything else you say, pay attention to how you say and talk about yourself. Stop minimizing your what you do. When people, when people, Talk about stuff that you bring to the table. Don't say, oh, you know, that's just my little such and such. No, it's not little. You know, when people talk talk about the business venture, you, well, you know, that's my little business. No, that ain't your little business. That's my, my massive business. That's my enterprise. Start speaking 
highly of those things. You know, talk about your gifts. And, uh, you know, that's just my little gift. No, that's your earth shattering, world changing gift. Hell shaking gift. Start talking positively about you. Number two, add values to others. One of the greatest ways to build your self-esteem is to add values to others. When you add value to others, when you help somebody, you naturally feel better about yourself. When you build somebody else up, you naturally feel good about yourself. No one has ever went and donated food or clothes or volunteered or did any of that for someone less fortunate and left there feeling bad about themselves. Nobody. You, you, it's impossible. You can't do something for somebody and then feel bad about yourself. So adding value to somebody automatically builds your self-esteem. Number, number three, stop comparing yourself to anyone. We talked about that a little earlier. Stop comparing yourself. Realize that you have your own gifts, your own abilities. Number four, move beyond your self-limiting beliefs. Stop limiting yourself to what you can do and understand that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He said his, your, his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Then you're when you're weak, then are you strong? And so you have no excuse. Those three laws tonight are what I want to be the foundation and the basis upon what we talk about in the subsequent 12 laws. And so I want you all to be ready. Come prepared. We're going to jump on time the next two to three uh, weeks as God takes us to a higher level of growth. And I want you to download this PowerPoint. Uh, I put it in the in the description, in the early part of the chat, I'll add it uh, here. Also, for those of you that joined us uh, late, I want I want to add that so that you you can have the ability to download that and go over that this information that we went through. These are the first five laws, and we'll go first three laws, and we'll go over five more next week, and we'll we'll, we'll cover them.